Law Matters. Of course it does. Hi, I'm Debbie Moraes, your host and moderator. The program has been created, as you know, to educate, inform, and help you with Law Matters because the law matters. Understand the law better, and you're in a better position to decide how to protect yourself, your family, and your business. We continue to provide information and resources that will help you determine whether or not you actually need to contact a lawyer. Perhaps we even help you determine you can handle some issues yourself. If you do need additional outside counsel, you'll be better prepared, and as a result, so will the professionals you select. Our goal, of course, is to save you time, money, and hopefully achieve the best possible results. We welcome and once again thank the Bazaar and Associates Law Firm in East Providence. Thank you. David, welcome. David Bazaar. Um, today we're going to discuss family court, actually family court continued. Today, settlements, the dollars and cents, and the other costly issues. Part of it, the debt and income division and property that's marital and non-marital, but also the other mind-boggling and painful issues about custody, the other precious issues. So let's start with the settlement issue. So people decide that they're going to marry, they have to split the spoils. So how do you decide what is marital and non-marital and is that a clear issue? How do you go about determining that, David? So, actually, every state has its own rules. Okay. In Rhode Island, they have a doc, uh, statute, um, Rhode Island General Law 15-16- whatever, <laughs> 5-16.1, um, which lays out what's marital and what's not. And for the most part, anything acquired during the marriage is marital. Some exceptions are something that might be acquired by gift or inheritance is not included in the marital pot. Um, some things that you own prior to the marriage would be considered separate property. And um, if you uh, have a personal injury claim, for example, that's considered personal in nature to you and it's not part of the marital assets. And just to pick up on one other aspect of that, if you owned something prior to the marriage and you change the nature of it somehow, that it becomes part of something else that you purchased together. You had a property maybe and then you sold it to get a bigger property. Does that change that and completely uh, discount what that portion was? I mean, the dollar value of that portion? There's two ways that you can change the nature of uh, separately owned property, um, property owned prior to the marriage. Uh, as I said, for the most part, it's separate property, it's not marital property. Mm -hmm. uh, any gain in value during the marriage may be considered potentially as marital, but if you take that property, and you're using the example of a home, say, and then you add your spouse's name to that home or you sell the home and buy something else together, then you've changed the nature of that from being non-marital to marital. And there's another doctrine in the law called transmutation, which is also a way of changing the nature of property. So the furniture in the house, for example, you owned the house and all the furniture in it. You and your spouse have shared that use of that furniture for 25 years. Um, you put your spouse's name on the house the furniture could also become marital and we can even be including antiques and stuff in that nature. So there are ways of you doing things during the marriage that can change what might otherwise have been non-marital property into marital property. And would the uh, a prenuptial or whatever have precluded that from becoming part of the issue if there's a divorce? So prenuptial agreements, and again, vary state by state. Okay. But for the most part, the law says you can contract to do whatever you want. I think there's some limits to that, and the Supreme Court, especially in Rhode Island, may be getting to the point where they want to have someone test those limits because I don't think it's as freewheeling as everybody thinks it may be or hopes that it might be. But for the most part, if you disclose all your assets and your liabilities, and you have a free exchange of information and both parties are in an equal bargaining situation free to enter into a contract as long as you disclose everything for the most part you can make whatever agreement between the two parties that you want okay and while we were talking about 
um, non-marital assets that were acquired before the marriage. How do you deal with the debt that was incurred? Does that work the same way when the debt has to be divided too? So, yes. Um, and this is interesting because I've seen it change a little bit during the course of my practice. It was originally basically any, met, any debt acquired during the marriage was marital. Now the court looks a little bit closer at what the debt was used for, who acquired it, why was it acquired. For example, college loans, student loans for children. There's some case law that says if one of the parties to the divorce takes out a loan for a child and doesn't tell the other party and doesn't have any involvement with the other party and the other party may not have agreed to that, that may be that spouse's debt, maybe. Oh, and, interesting. And so you have to explore, you know, what was the agreement, what did parties know, did both parties agree to it, but it was just taken in one of the parties' names. If that's the case, then that's probably going to get split like an asset would get split. Yes. And how about something that is obviously one party or the other's debt? Um, her... Um, her clothes, or I don't know, does Botox how, or how, yeah, well, how you does that work? Cosmetic that surgery. We like how to use cosmetic work? surgery. Yeah. <laughs> so I suppose, um, just like the um, let's say husband in this case isn't going to get the benefit of the cosmetic work done to the <laughs> wife after the divorce, uh, he's probably not going to be on the hook for the debt associated with that improvement. I also look at it this way. How about something easier? A car debt. You, okay, you buy example. a car, and there's a loan on it, the asset is going to you, so your spouse shouldn't have to be responsible for the loan on the asset that you're getting. So I look at it the same way as our other example, but basically the court can look at what was the debt incurred for, and if it was incurred for something personal in nature or that you're getting the benefit of or it's going with you, then it's probably your debt. If it were a credit card debt and it was in just one name but both parties benefited from it, travel, things bought in the house that are being split equally, things of that nature, the court probably is going to split that debt. And what about if one party is planning on making a move to that marital status to change it uh, and suddenly decides, that he or she will accrue much more debt, buy many more things, and then present that other half, that bill. Does that get discounted? Do you or do lawyers, once they get involved, when there's a suit that's, uh, or a petition to divorce, do you get involved about when this was purchased and suddenly it looks like someone is making a Sure. unpleasant and run or whatever. Yeah, so if somebody is buying things and keeping all of those things and incurring the debt, it's a good chance that the court will assign that debt to the person who incurred it, especially if it's pretty clear that it's being done when they know that um, they're going to file shortly and they're just trying to acquire things. For example, if someone's planning on moving out and they are going to rent an apartment and furnish the apartment and want all the furniture, that they put into it, they're probably going to get the debt that they incurred in buying all of those things. Or on the other side, someone knows that they're going to be divorced, they have a business, and then suddenly they decide to purchase many things or write out checks to support their business that needs to be taken care of. How, how about that side of it? So I, I would, as the lawyer, want to dig in and see what was purchased and what it was used for and if there's any asset attached to it. Um, if it's a reasonable and ordinary business expense and it's not anything different than ordinarily goes on in the course of running that business, it's probably just going to get factored in like any other expense. But if it were for a trip, for example, um, that was purely personal in nature um, and just done to try to lower the value of something or incur debt in doing that, then that's going to get discounted. Okay. Certainly when it comes time to divide up the assets, everything is supposed to be fair. If you are mediating a divorce or if you are serving as a, the attorney in a divorce, um, I assume the first thing that you want to assume is that whatever someone has disclosed as their, what they own, has been truthful and complete and honest in divulging the goods. Yep. And suppose you, at what point do you consider that maybe that needs to be investigated? We talked a little bit about it last time, about maybe somebody's 
doing something deceptive. How do you approach that, David? As a mediator, um, mediation is based on having a full and accurate disclosure of all assets and debts, and um, it can't be a successful mediation if that's not done. Mm -hmm. What many lawyers will do to protect themselves and their client either in a case that's come through mediation or in one that they've just settled, is to put language into a property settlement agreement that would say any undisclosed assets that are discovered will be divided in, uh, unequally between the parties. So maybe 60-40 to the party get who discovers the asset and the one who hit it may only get 40% and the party who discovered it would get 60%. And if it's a 50-50 division, otherwise there's some incentive not to hide it. And if you dis discover something after the divorce has been decreed, three months later, whatever it is. Final judgment. Final yeah. judgment. Then is there ever an appeal? Do people go back and say, "Never, we really do want to take a look at more now that you've discovered one. Let's go back and review everything. I don't know. So Does that happen? It wouldn't be an appeal because it would be newly discovered evidence. Okay. Something that you didn't know or sh or, and had no ability to know about. So you're either supposed to know or should have known. It doesn't fall into that category. Okay. So something has been discovered, and you then just file a motion to reopen the case and say there was an undisclosed asset, and uh, this is what it is, and this needs to be dealt with. And if there's an agreement, I get 60% of it or whatever the agreement says. Okay. And one last thing about that issue. So if someone is... Uh, representing uh, one of the parties and then finds out that that lawyer is representing the soon-to-be ex, his business. Is that a conflict of interest? Should someone be worried about that? Well, if there's a family business, so to speak, yes. the lawyer for the family business probably does have an inherent conflict to represent one party or the other yes. to a divorce. So what should happen? Get separate lawyers. Absolutely. Demand it. Yep. Would, if it if it didn't happen, the minute it goes to before a judge, would a judge um, uh, only, take issue about with only that or no? One of the parties raises it. Only if it so is, okay. I've had cases before where there's an attorney on the other side who shouldn't be on the other side, whether that's because they um, met with both clients and um, gave advice to both clients or represented both clients in the past on something else where they would have information that wouldn't have otherwise maybe been disclosed to a new attorney, then um, we have to file a motion for them to be removed from the case. And okay. we've done that. What about alimony or maintenance, as it was called? Is okay. that still uh, viable, <clears throat> or do most people say it's fine, it's beside the point now? What well, happens now? Every state's different. Massachusetts okay. has a statute on alimony. I will be curious to see what happens with Massachusetts statute after, well, actually towards uh, the end of this year because of the tax changes in the tax code. Right now, any alimony that's being paid or is being paid pursuant to an order, a final judgment that's entered before the end of the year is deductible to the person paying the alimony and taxable to the person receiving the alimony. That's interesting. After the end of the year, it's always been that way, okay. but after the end of the year, that's no longer the case. So hurry up and get divorced now? If there's going to be alimony <laughs> and you're going to be paying it, okay. I've that's seen that actually um, being discussed more and more because you know there's the waiting period for the final judgment. So if you're not in court in, in front of a judge Soon, the three-month waiting period may take you to the end of next year or beyond, or beyond. and it's the beyond that's the problem. Interesting. Good to know. Yep. <laughs> so what about the other precious issue when it comes to divorces, the issue about custody of the kids? Once upon a time, it was always to mom. Mm -hmm. Well, there are lots of different ways to describe mom now. Is it still that preference is given to mom or is that completely neutralized now? I think it's fairly neutralized in the sense that the standard is best interest of the child okay. and the doctrines that used to exist such as the tender years doctrine which was a doctrine that said an infant young child needs to be with its or his or her mother. Um, that doctrine may still get a little sway for a, a newborn um, but as the child gets older, um, the, the 
leaning towards the mom over a dad as being a better choice is much less the situation and more and more. So I think I may have um, discussed this before, but when I started, it was custody to mom, visitation to dad. That's what it was, almost always, unless there was some real significant issue. Then we developed the legal doctrine of joint custody, which was both mom and dad should have joint legal custody, which really only deals with legal issues. Who can talk to the teachers, who can talk to the doctors, who can be involved with decision making for important decisions for the child. So that came into vogue and has been followed very fairly commonly um, as opposed to sole custody, which is much less used. And that's really only when the two parents can't get along and one parent just can't make decisions with the other parent and there's clearly one who's better and be in a better position to make those decisions. So we pretty much have a fairly routine joint custody. Then it became the placement issue. And when I was... Physical custody? Physical placement. Um, physical custody. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first started, um, there was an older judge who just couldn't understand that and I had two people come in who really had a plan for shared placement really and um, it was beyond the judge's comprehension because he was still back in the sole custody physical placement to mom and that's that but we explained it to him and he said good luck to you if that's what you want to do try it and of course it worked out very well because the parties had worked it out and that's always a better thing so shared custody is a little bit more common but not 100%. It's not like joint custody is almost always the, the routine. Shared custody in the right circumstance can work. And then um, we've gone from visitation to parenting time because whoever doesn't have that actual physical placement shouldn't be visiting their children. They should be parenting their children. So What's the distinction? How it, do you it, make it's, that um, It's more of um, a linguistic distinction except mm. that there's some what you call something sometimes is what it is so spend time with your children parenting your children um, being with your children teaching learning you know from in and, and teaching them things and in doing that other than just I'm visiting my child and I'm returning my child and that's the end of it so it's parenting time and most judges today believe that every child benefits from having as much time as possible and reasonable with both parents. And of course the big red flag with that is if there's ever an issue about some sort of abuse, whether it's physical abuse or there's drug or alcohol abuse, then someone has a problem, but are they then denied, well, whether you call it visitation or parenting time, how does that change and how do you well, control that? The standard is still best interest of the child. So clearly it's not in the best interest of the child to, even though if you start like on level ground and both parents are equally good, then of course that's where you need to make some distinctions and have a, as much time with each parent. Where one parent clearly is not going to be a good influence and not even safe for the child to be with, the court absolutely will and still consider all of that and saying no, that parent might not visit at all or that parent might have supervised visitation time. And of course, there's many cases still, unfortunately, where one parent or the other has a drug or alcohol issue, and the court is going to say, I want you to go to random drug testing, I want you to visit supervised, and when you show me you've grown up and you've been able to make yourself a better person and put yourself in a better place where it's safe for the child to be with you, then I'll consider it. But certainly, they're going to curtail time and supervision with that parent who needs it. Okay, factor in, if you will, um, two angry people who are getting divorced. He, I know he, they make things up, I know he's drinking, I know he's this, he should not have access to the child. So uh, he said, she said, uh, I understand that there's a way or a process in place to evaluate or determine some truth. How does that play out and where do you get involved? To, it depends, to make that happen. on, depends on what the allegations are um, and certainly that happens and false accusations are made and so if it's um, he's on drugs, I know he takes drugs, this, that, the other thing, the court can send the other person and you perhaps because what's good for the goose is good for the gander as they say sometimes, both down to the uh, 
t drug testing part of the court, and they can test both of them right there on the spot. So if she's making allegations and he's saying, no, this is not true or whatever, and he comes out clean, it's going to be, you know, uh, something that shows maybe she wasn't telling the truth. And if that were the case, David, does she then end up having some dire consequences? She fibbed. That's yeah. not nice. But is there any real consequence to it? There can be. And it depends on what the nature of it is. If it's just something where maybe he wasn't um, using drugs this day, but it, it, you know, on other days, and there's some reason for her to say that, you know, where does it really evidence pop up a lot? Uh, social media. So this is why I'm saying it. I have evidence here where the other person posted, you know, uh, I'm at this party, we're doing this, we're doing that, or whatever. Some evidence other than just the accusation is always, of course, as we say, better to come into court with your evidence and ready to show it. There won't be much consequence. But if it's just someone making a bald accusation and, and it's proven to be wrong, that, there can be consequences. And if there isn't proof readily available, uh, might, some, might a judge decide that uh, we need to see some supervised parenting, supervised visitation to see how the behavior is or if there's some residual from last night's escapades or whatever. Yeah. Do, might they try to do that or might that yeah. be a workable solution? The judge is always going to take steps to protect the children. So if in the judge's estimation some of the things that are being said would put the children in jeopardy where there's no supervision, they'll put supervision in place. And if there is abuse, say, the sp on the spousal side, not to the child but between mm -hmm. spouse, um, spouses, would a judge intervene and say, I think that that visit with the child then should be supervised anyway, even though the parent isn't likely, isn't hurting the mother, say for example, isn't likely to hurt the child, but we don't know, we, we need to supervise that just to make sure that that anger doesn't get redirected to the child? Sure, and actually in the statute on custody, um, there is something where the judge is supposed to consider domestic abuse in any decision on custody and it certainly can apply to how visitation should be carried out and so if there's domestic abuse of one spouse by the other and that visitation therefore needs to be supervised obviously it's got to be someone other than the spouse that's supervising it would either be a, a family member a court um, personnel or some other person that the a court or the parties can agree on Okay, and speaking about the visitation issue, when you were talking about custody earlier, and sometimes it's, uh, well, more often than not, they'd like to have uh, equal shared custody, even though there might be one physical placement. If there's more of that, by, by reason of default, does it not happen that that brings more uh, divorced couples into court once one party's life changes. A job change, um, one of them wants to move away for a new fresh start. Does that then bring more suits and more legal um, issues back to the court, back to you? <laughs> Great for lawyers' fees, but mm. I mean, does that actually happen now? Do you see more of that? Well, it, anything to do with the children is always subject to modification. So if custody um, or visitation should change because of a change of circumstances and you have to have a significant change of circumstances, then the parties can agree. Just like at the beginning of the case they could have agreed, they can agree. And if they can work something out and put it in writing, and usually if there's a writing already, a, person, a property settlement agreement, a marital settlement agreement, then any changes to it should be in writing. And if there isn't, you should put it in writing anyway. But the parties can always agree and put it in writing. If the parties can't agree, then the only recourse is to take it back to the court. And as you said, relocation actually comes up. And that's one where you have to either get an agreement between the parties or go back to court. And speaking of getting it in writing, this is probably a good time to bring up uh, regardless of what the custody situation is, if one parent is taking the child out of state vacation or whatever, is that not supposed to go over, review if you would, the writing, written requirements so that uh, TSA doesn't get involved if you're boarding a plane and whatever. What are the rules? So certainly if you're leaving the country, 
They have to have a passport, which the child can only get usually with the signature of both parents unless one parent has a court order saying they have sole custody and they can get a passport for the child. Mm -hmm. When you leave the country, the um, rules are you have to either have permission from the other parent or you're going to have to have, again, either a court order or something that authorizes you to leave the country with the child. So you're not going out of the country without one of those things. Traveling state to state usually doesn't require something. However, if you have a, an agreement, for example, that says if either party is going to travel with the children, then they should notify the other one, especially if it's going to affect their time, a parenting time that they would have had with the child. So we usually spell out either in orders or in agreements what the requirements are so that you can make those arrangements before you go. I'm not sure where I came across it, but when I was doing some research for this, I did see something about Massachusetts having some requirement that even if you take the child out of state, there needs to be some record or some written permission that allows it. So I imagine that too is a state-to-state -state issue in some yeah, cases? Yeah, it, it is, except what I'm saying, that should be part of the court order too. And the person has to carry it with them. Though. Yeah, and, um, but again, let's not um, confuse some things. Okay. If you're in Seekonk and you want to go to East Providence to go Different. shopping with your child, you mm -hmm. don't need some special passport or permission from yes. the court to yes. do that. It's if you're traveling f for some period of time out of state that you may need some of those documentation. I think it did refer to that and that is a good point of clarification. How about the numbers of different kinds of parenting couples now? Um, gay, lesbian, um, if it is a situation with, say, a gay couple, one is the biological mother, how does that play out when there is a custody issue? Is there going to be a um, proclivity to have a judge say it should go, the child should go to the biological parent? Or even if there are two women who are married and neither one is the biological, how does that split happen? Is that the same as if it were Male, female? Yeah, um, so I'm gonna make some assumptions in your um, hypothetical okay. that um, both parties are the parent of the child, either by adoption yes. or some Fear it. other. Okay. okay, so it doesn't matter which one is the biological parent and which is the other parent, as long as you're both parents legally, then it's the same rules that would apply to any other divorce and custody situation. Good to know. And just one other variance, I guess, there. If one was already a parent to the child, then marries, then is there any uh, assumption that that original parent has more right than the other? It depends on the situation, the length of the marriage, what the deal has been, so to speak, between the child and the other parent. There is case law in Rhode Island about someone being called a putative father or mother, where the father raised the child in this particular case from the time the child was born. The mom then said when they were getting divorced, you're not the dad, DNA testing showed that, but the court said it doesn't matter, he is the putative dad, he raised that child the whole time. Good coverage in a short period of time. We certainly covered quite a bit. We appreciate your tuning into The Law Matters. Stay tuned to The Law Matters. It matters to you.